Two years ago, I was here in America when a black man won the White House and the Democrats swept to power in Congress. The age of conservatism is over, we said. A new liberal left era has dawned in these United States. We were wrong. The right is already back with a vengeance, and in the shape of a grassroots insurgency called the Tea Party, it's more conservative than ever. Furious that America's national debt is at a record peacetime high, in uproar over President Obama's health care reforms, and fed up with big government and high taxes, the Tea Party is taking to the streets and the ballot box. It claims to have no leader, but it does have his heroes and heroines. I know that many of us today, we are worried about what we face. Let's stand together, let's stand with honor, let's restore America. And it's being whipped up by Fox News TV hosts like Glenn Beck. Who are we? What is it we believe? We must advance or perish. I've been following American politics for over 30 years. So I've come back to the United States to find out what makes the Tea Party tick, to meet its people, and to discover if it's really going to change American politics. As I start my travels, the campaign for the crucial midterm elections in November for both Houses of Congress, the Senate, and the House of Representatives is underway. The Rocky Mountain state of Colorado, once the Wild West, is my favorite state in the Union. In the last three elections, the Democrats here have largely swept the board. Even so, this state is attracting more people to the Tea Party than any other in the Union. One third of all registered voters here claim to identify with it. The Tea Party is obsessed with myths about America's past, that it was uniquely established as the land of the free. So we're better for a Tea Party candidate to find votes than at an 18th century pioneer's reenactment. Breathe that in, that's freedom and beauty in America. Well, why don't you remember old Bald Bob when you get that ballot? You got it. Bob McConnell is a veteran action man. He fought in Vietnam and climbed Everest. He's running for office for the first time. With the enthusiastic backing of the Tea Party, he's out to capture the Republican nomination for Congress. The Tea Party's aim is to infiltrate the Republican Party and shift it to the right. It thinks mainstream Republican politicians are as much to blame as Democrats for a federal government which they believe so big, so corrupt, that it threatens their very way of life. It's the crushing weight of continual intrusion into our lives, and that's what has people incredibly frustrated. And, and it was frustration, but then you begin to talk about our health care. You begin to talk about this, this um, financial reform legislation that does nothing to deal with the true issues. I see no reason to have that degree of federal intrusion into the management of what I consider to be our land. Yeah. Must have said something wrong. <laughs> The master. <laughs> Whoa! Is that your primary opponent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is he? Is he about? Is he attacking? Maybe. Don't maybe, worry. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Bring, bring it on. <laughs> tea Party stands for taxed enough already, and a nod to the Boston Tea Party, the tax revolt against an imperial government in London that sparked the American Revolution. For people like Bob, their target is imperial government in Washington. This isn't happening in a vacuum. Colorado's coal and mining industries have tanked, house prices have crashed, jobs are scarce. 
Hard times are fueling the Tea Party insurgency. Andrew and Liz are regular Americans. They used to believe in the American dream. They ran a small property business, but it went bust in the financial crash of 2008. To make ends meet, he's driving a truck 18 hours a day. They feel they're suffering through no fault of their own, and that big government is only making it worse, so they've joined the Tea Party. There's going to be way more demands from our government as far as financial resources than we, the private sector, can come up with. Even if you taxed our labor at 100%, if you took everything we earn, you still can't cover the bills. Liz is out of work, so she has time to run her own Tea Party group. We've got 21 days that Tea Parties can happen. Times may be tough for Liz, but she doesn't look to the government for help. We believe in the work ethic. We believe in earning what we get. We don't want handouts. I don't want... It. Even if I were on the street today, if my husband and I were on the street today, I would not go to the government for a handout. I would not go and say, look, I'm entitled. I'm entitled. You owe me. Nobody owes me. Nobody owes anybody. We're trying to point out that we can't carry, 50% of the population cannot carry the load for the other 50%. It, it, it's not going to work. It's not going to last. Let's go. Liz is a political novice, but today she's putting on her first ever Tea Party event. Liz? Hi. I'm Andrew. Andrew, it's nice Good to, to see you. you. What upsets you most is you think the federal government is too big. Mm. They are out of constitutional boundaries. They are doing things that they don't have the authority to do. It's reached beyond soft tyranny now. Mm. I mean, this is out and out tyranny. Really? Now, you see, you say that, and yet here we are today in Colorado. People look prosperous and happy, and yet you say it's like a tyranny. Colorado has suffered greatly. People are losing jobs left and right. They're losing their homes left and right. You can't shut down the free market. You can't do everything in your power to discourage the free market, entrepreneurism, um, and not have this happen. I mean, this, this is the natural course when socialism starts taking over. They take from us what they don't have the authority to take it's called progressivism, folks, and it's destroying our representative republic. Progressivism is statism, and they both add up to socialism. So, first contact with the Tea Party. What to make of them? They're clearly a bunch of decent people. Middle class, middle Americans, ordinary people. They care about the country. They don't like the direction it's going in, and they definitely don't like big government and again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's in the mainstream of American political thought, which is built on limited government. They think the government's so big, though, they really think America's on the brink of being a tyranny, that there's already a tyrannical government in Washington, D.C. And I think that is, that's a bit of a stretch. Tyranny is a recurring theme for the Tea Party. It's fundamentalist reading of the Constitution as the Founding Fathers putting strict limits on the federal government and giving most powers to the states. The Tea Party thinks some of the most basic functions of government, health, education, welfare, aren't the job of the federal government. They should be left to the states. The Oath Keepers is a group of ex-servicemen and ex-policemen running a forceful campaign saying they now need to act on their oaths to defend this particular view of the Constitution. Oath Keeper Richard Mack is a former sheriff and a regular speaker on the Tea Party circuit. Barack Obama is a tyrant. He is a socialist, 
He is uh, not, uh, he's anti-American. What do you call somebody who, who wants to control your air, wants to control your water, wants to control your land, wants to control all farms, wants to control all business, believes all my money belongs to the government. It's not mine, it belongs to them. They can determine how much I have, how much I don't have. So what in, is that? So That's tyrants. Have you been to a country run by a tyrant? Uh, I would, pro yeah, oh yes, uh -huh. sure. Yeah, I, I, I've been to countries uh, run by tyrants, but... The so, thing I is, mean, a country but, run but by tyrant, there's no freedom of speech. Political opponents are rounded up and well, put in jail without due process. People right. are frightened to have interviews like this. I right. mean, if this was a tyranny, you and I wouldn't be sitting here be able to do this interview. We'd both well, be in jail. There's nothing free about our country. But you're free to say what you want. I can say what I want. If you and lived in Hitler's been. Germany or Stalin's Russia, right. you would not have been free to say what you want. But they also believe the same thing Barack Obama believes in. He believes in gun control, as did they. He believes in uh, huge taxation, as did they. Barack Obama believes he Win owns... Well, well, let's, Winston, let me finish. Well, but Winston Churchill believed in gun control. Okay. Does that make him they, a Nazi? Uh, he was wrong. I didn't say they were Nazis. I say Does he was wrong. Does that make him like Hitler? Uh, look at history and decide that for yourself. The idea that President Obama is a socialist, even a communist, and the federal government a tyranny isn't unique to the Wild West. In only two years, the Tea Party has become the fastest growing political movement in America, with over 2,000 chapters nationwide, hundreds of thousands of members. So how did it all begin? Some say it was sparked by this surprise rant from a TV reporter against President Obama's mortgage bailout plan. This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage that has an extra bathroom and can't pay their bills? Raise their hand. How about we all? <laughs> President Obama, are you listening? We're thinking of having a Chicago Tea Party in July. All you capitalists that want to show up to Lake Michigan, I'm going to start organizing. But what really got the Tea Party's juices going was the Obama health care reforms. I don't know how passing health care will play politically, but I know it's right. Ted, Teddy Roosevelt knew it was right. Harry Truman knew what it was right. Ted Kennedy knew it was right. And if you believe that it's right, then you've got to help us finish this fight. Now, plenty of Americans felt these health reforms were long overdue. But for the Tea Party, it was just more big, bad government. And this was the angry reaction to black congressmen supporting Obamacare that led to claims that the Tea Party had a racist tinge. The Democrats were slow to see the Tea Party as a threat. I'm going to put on my teabagger hat. But comedians like Bill Maher were hitting back with biting satire. But the problem with the Tea Party movement, <laughs> besides their almost universal rejection of dentistry, <laughs> is that they want money for nothing and chicks for free. <laughs> they want a deregulated free market and their jobs to stay here in the U.S. They want guaranteed health coverage regardless of pre-existing conditions, but without a big government mandate. They want to call themselves teabaggers and people to keep a straight face. <laughs> and of course, they want big tax cuts along with deficit reduction. I can't even think of a suitable analogy for that disconnect. Why now and why the Tea Party? Industrial Ohio, in America's heartlands, it's a long way from rural Colorado. It's a swing state, usually narrowly balanced between Republicans and Democrats. It voted for Obama in 2008, but the Tea Party is making inroads even here. Dayton, Ohio was once a prosperous blue-collar town. Not now. Long-term industrial decline has been accelerated by the financial crash. 
This used to be a massive General Motors car plant. It's closed now, a victim of the recession and globalization. I'm meeting three of his ex-workers, feeling the pull of the Tea Party message. First of all, GM was bailed out. But, but they chose not this plant. They but the chose company to was close our out. plant because it was political. Yeah. They just built five hundred thirty million dollar plant in Mexico. The stimulus package, the action of the federal government, you don't feel has really made a difference. No. It pisses people off. More. No. The whole your tax dollars at work, road construction, for instance. There is not a street in Dayton or around Dayton within fifty miles that is not under construction. Okay. And I understand that that creates jobs. However, That's part of the stimulus. was it really necessary? Oh, none right. none Thank of these you. people that are working Thank on you. my roads are from my area. Oh, Thank you. No. What the hell? Amen. Exactly. The Tea Party, where does this fit in? Is it capitalizing on the feelings of unhappiness being let down? I think the Tea Party was an idea that was started by some pissed off Americans that are sick and tired of being forced into things by the government and the government's getting too big and getting away from the original concept of um, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and they want to be the socialist government and I think they just got really pissed off and said we're not going to take it anymore. Over on the other side of town in the middle class suburbs, even taxpayers with good jobs are nervous about the future. Joe Lisanti is a local GP and Tea Party activist. So what do you guys think about the elections coming up? I think people are really angry. Yeah. I think they're angry at the fact that... Do you that, think it's uh, anti-Obama or, I mean, do you think it's anti... Policies. Anti I, think it goes beyond, policies. I think it goes beyond... I think it's anti-spending because the yeah. amount of spending that's kicked in in the last two years is I is think anybody tremendous. that would have been in there, no matter what president was in there and, and had these policies passed, it doesn't matter who's in there. Yeah. Right. It's and the I'm policies that we don't like. Game. Obama's health care reforms had been Joe's turning point. The reforms extend health care for the young, the old and the poor. But crucially, Obama is making it compulsory for every citizen to buy health insurance. What's wrong with people having a minimum, that, that there's a mandate that everybody has to have a minimum amount of coverage? If you mandate people purchase something, in this country, the government's never mandated people purchase a private product. And the problem is, is they pass the law without even letting people know what that price of that product is. I'll give you an example. The federal government now thinks you need to buy a refrigerator. It's a mandate. We're going to decide what kind of refrigerator it is, but if you don't purchase it, we're going to penalize you for it. Do you see where I'm getting with this, this argument? Yeah, well, so not, what I'm, makes... What, what not, makes I think the, the analogy is a bit of a stretch. Well, my, my question is this. Is I what mean, makes, I can live without... I, it's better to have a refrigerator than not to have one, but I could live without one. It's kind of hard to live without any kind of health insurance. Health is not wrong. It's the way this Congress decided to jam it down the American people's sure. throat. You've had the Republican Party in the White House for most of years since the end of the Second World War, and they've never done any of that. The Republican Party is just as much as a problem as the Democratic Party. You and, want that's, to and that's why the Tea Party... You want to change it. Well, sure. I'd love to change the Republican Party. Absolutely. And, and if, you, if you talk to enough of the people in the Tea Party... They're not real good friends with the Republican Party because you're right. It, it's, it was status quo. And They're the, the problem, insurgents. You're right. The Tea Party is the insurgents of the Republican Party. Right-wing insurgencies are nothing new in America. Take Arizona, another Wild West state with a reputation for rugged individualism and political libertarianism. His favorite son, Barry Goldwater, captured the Republican presidential nomination and ran for the White House in 1964. He was a zealot for small government. And among his backers, a Hollywood actor turned politician. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. This is the issue of this election. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite 
in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. I went to speak to Goldwater's son, a keeper of his father's faith. This Tea Party movement and the rise of conservative Republicans, is this a continuation of your father's crusade? Uh, yeah, I would say so, sure. Mm -hmm. Why now? What's brought it back? Oh, President Obama's brought it back. Hope and change. That kind of hope and change uh, is not what uh, most Americans uh, really want. They don't want socialism. They want freedom. I understand that there's a very strong and uh, honorable tradition in America, going way back to the Founding Fathers, unlimited government. But I'm not quite clear what, in the end, what government you would get rid of. Most of it. Why do, why do we need government? Why do you need somebody to tell you what to do? You think a bureaucrat who comes to work at 9 to 5 has your kid's best interests in mind? Absolutely not. Why should somebody in Washington tell you how to educate your kids? Tell me that. Answer that question. If you can't answer it, then you understand why we're libertarian and why we like our freedom. They say that Mr. Obama is a tyranny. They like him to Hitler or Stalin. What do you make of that kind of language? You have to read through the message. Read through the message. Don't be so literal. You know, they are passionate about what they believe. And they, and they use descriptive terms to light your fire. And you fall for it. Don't fall for it. Read the message. They're saying, we don't want Obama socialism. We don't want all this government. Goldwater found himself on the wrong end of a landslide in 1964, but his libertarian ideas live on. Today, the Tea Party has blended them with fiscal and social conservatism to make a potent conservative brew for the 21st century. The Tea Party's ideas weren't enough to explain its sudden rise. Something else was at play. When I was based in New York reporting on America, TV news was nowhere near as partisan as today. That's all changed. And although the Tea Party makes a big deal about having no leaders of being a grassroots movement, these grassroots are well fertilized by a big media of the right. Most notably, Rupert Murdoch's Fox News. Its most prominent host is a Tea Party icon, Glenn Beck. He's blatantly biased, his delivery compelling. This is the disease. This is the disease in America. It's not just spending, it's not just taxes, it's not just corruption, it is progressivism. Beck is a self-appointed Tea Party head teacher, an inspiration to his followers. His hokey on-air presentation includes a lot of crying. And it seems like the voices of our leaders and special interests and the media, they're surrounding us. It, is, it sounds intimidating. But you know what? Pull away the curtain you'll realize that there isn't anybody there. It's just a few people that are just pressing the buttons and their voices are actually really weak. The truth is, they don't surround us. We surround them. This is our country. Beck has called President Obama a socialist and a Marxist. He's likened his economic policies to those of Nazi Germany. He's even speculated that detention camps are being prepared in the United States. And he's coining it. When he's not hamming it up for the camera, his books, tours, TV shows have earned him at least $35 million. If Glenn Beck is the Tea Party guru, the darling of the movement is undoubtedly Sarah Palin. Her folksy anti-Washington message goes down a treat with her new books and TV career on Fox and Discovery. The small-town girl from Alaska is now a multi-millionaire too. Palin promotes a new kind of conservative feminism for her female followers, her mama grizzlies, she calls them, 
in her super slick campaign ads. This year will be remembered as a year when common sense conservative women get things done for our country. Here in Alaska, I always think of the mama grizzly bears that rise up on their hind legs when somebody's coming to attack their cubs, to do something adverse toward their cubs. You thought pit bulls were tough. Well, you don't want to mess with the mama grizzlies. This is more than rhetoric. The Republican Party's never been very female friendly. But Tea Party Republicans are at least 50% women, some its most prominent candidates for Congress. A lot of women coming together. Male or female to be endorsed by Palin is every Tea Party candidate's dream. Often it's been crucial in winning a Republican nomination. The midterm elections are now full of Tea Party hopefuls. They forced the Republican Party to the right. Now they hope to do the same to America. Sharon Angle in Nevada wants to phase out Social Security. Joe Miller in Alaska wants to eliminate the Federal Department of Education. Ken Buck in Colorado is anti-abortion even if a woman was raped. And Christine O'Donnell in Delaware is passionate in her fundamentalist beliefs. The Bible says that lust in your heart is committing adultery. So you, you can't masturbate without lust. Christian evangelism, like O'Donnell's, with its strong social conservatism, has embraced the Tea Party. I'm heading to the Kentucky Bible Belt to see what role the church is playing. Here, religion really matters. You don't go far without seeing a church. Many are spreading the Tea Party message. like that Christianity is almost viewed as a dangerous enemy of America rather than the friend of America that produces sound and wholesome citizens for its nation. And as I've said before, if you don't like America and its constitution declaration, you ought to go to whatever country it is uh, that you can enjoy that. We have the, the mayor of New York City and uh, the president promoting the building of a Muslim mosque in the very face of the 9-11 victims in New York City. I believe that America's at a crossroads and I believe we have an opportunity for revival. There are all kinds of conservative groups, 9-11, the Tea Party, there was ever a time for men of God to lift up their voices like a trumpet in America. The time is right right now. You want to come to this altar and pray and ask God, Oh God, would you touch our nation? God was the election of a president with a Muslim father praying on their minds? Was the growing number of Muslims in the United States seen as a threat to their Christian values? What would your reaction be if you had a Muslim president? Is that possible in your view of America? I fear that it could be. You do? We, yeah, I fear that because after 9-11, 2001, we have a man the president, uh, in the president in the office now uh, whose middle name is Hussein and who favors that a mosque should be built uh, at close to the site of the Twin Towers. I mean, Isn't that you, the freedom of a religion that America stands for? Certainly there is that freedom, but some are claiming it to be a building of victory, to declare a victory. You know, I was quite surprised by the, the blatant politics coming from the pulpit. And these are people who believe in a fundamental interpretation of the Constitution, or well, one of the fundamental inter parts of the Constitution, is a separation of church and state. America was founded on that, but it uh, wasn't happening tonight. You don't have to be a Christian to be in the Tea Party, but it helps. You feel more at home. Evangelical Christianity is never far from the surface. Indeed, Glenn Beck often seems keener to promote religious revival than limited government. Beck, a former alcoholic, has become a Mormon. Be prepared for a powerful performance and some more tears. We're in this faith because there are so many examples 
that are lighthouses to us, that we would like our family to be more like and like our selves to be more like. But it's a struggle getting there. Beck is a modern-day version of a hard-right preacher from the Great Depression of the 1930s, Father Coughlin, who used the new technology of the day, radio, to reach millions of Americans. On some nights, almost a third of the nation tuned in, something Beck can only dream of. We will endorse a candidate who can rise above his party and puts patriotism first. He may be a Democrat or a Republican or whatnot, but we're through with the sham battle of politicians, and now we're on our own. In the end, the radio priest flirted with fascism and lost his show, as well as the plot. Beck cannot be accused of either. Remember, in his worldview, Obama is the Nazi. In Kentucky, Baptist Justin Collins finds Beck's Fox TV shows so powerful they're unmissable. Saturday's message, shh, it's a big secret. I've only talked about it for six months on one of the biggest cable news shows in history. Keep it down just between us. Don't tell anyone in the media. The secret is God. This summer, Beck issued a call to action. It was time, he said, to restore America's honor. Time for his supporters to hold a huge rally in Washington. I don't know if he's talking directly to me so much as the, uh, the system of beliefs that he has is something that's internally relatable to me. You know, there's no political issue in play this weekend when we go there, but I hope it's another step toward, wow, half a million, a million, how many people show up to say we need to restore some values and, and integrity that's been lost in our country. In the back. In the back. The chance to travel with Justin and the Kentucky Tea Party was too good to miss. They'd be driving through the night to the heart of enemy territory, Washington. The rally would be a very public test of Tea Party strength. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, and we'll be doing that in a little while. Some DVDs. <laughs> President Obama, please. Tell him it's Mario. Hey, Barry, how you doing? Yeah. What time is tea time today? Got it. Oh, I'm going to be a little late, but hey, we are on the way. See ya. I think he just left town. <laughs> I soon learned that Mario is a so-called birther a group that believes that Obama wasn't born in the U.S. and hence has no right to be president. I would uh, uh, seriously like to uh, see that birth certificate. I would like to know where my president uh, uh, was so born and whether the, or not he's a citizen. We've seen the president. Uh, no, we haven't. We've seen a reasonable facsimile of it that is not valid and not legal. You don't seriously believe he's not an American? I don't know. I, I don't know. And what makes you do this? I love America, and I feel like we've lost our course. And the main reason I believe that is because of the debt we continue to incur, and I'm fearful of it. And I've heard that we were having a tea party in our local town, and that's before we were called that derogatory term uh, regarding a tea bag. Right. And I actually went to this rally with tea bags hanging on my shirt. I would never do that now, because they've turned that into such an offensive. Right. Thing. Where is this going? Is it just going to disappear after a while, or is it going to fundamentally change the way America does politics? I believe it's going to fundamentally change it. It's going to take time, but because we don't have a set leader, you can't cut off our head. Yes. And our feet keep moving. These Kentucky Tea Partiers are ordinary, God-fearing folk from the American heartland. And that's exactly how the Tea Party likes to portray itself, as a spontaneous uprising, a ramshackle, down-home movement of local groups. But its message is too consistent, its language right across the nation too similar for somebody or something not to be injecting a certain 
ideological discipline. That something turns out to be a well-established conservative lobbying group called Freedom Works in Washington. Think of it as the Tea Party's brain. Freedom Works is run by Dick Armey, a former leader of the Republican Party in Congress. He and his organization have been promoting limited government for years with limited success. Suddenly, with the rise of the Tea Party, it has an army beyond its wildest dreams. What's the relationship between Freedom Works and the Tea Party? These folks have never done this before. They don't know how to do it. And they found us on the internet and we basically began to call us and say, uh, you know, how do we put together a demonstration? How do we pull together a group and so forth? And our folks started advising them. So am I right in thinking that the fundamental aim is to reshape, remold the Republican Party in the image of the Tea Party and Freedom Works? No, I, I really think it's to restore the Republican Party in the image of Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan and the Founding Fathers. So we've said to the Republican Party, if you can get back to being like that, we want to work with you. The strategy is to, is to get in place people who will make the Republican Party fundamentally a party above all of limited government, mm -hmm. fiscal mm -hmm. conservatism, and the market. And antithetical to the Democrat Party, which today is a complete 100% sellout to the idea of big government and government control. Army's partner and the president of Freedom Works is economist Matt Kibbe. Turns out he's long been planning a Tea Party type movement. We rediscovered the Boston Tea Party when we were reading the, the literature of the left. There's, a, there's an organization called the Ruckus Society, which is one of the more radical leftist groups in the United States. Well, they use the Boston Tea Party in their training manual to teach their young people how to do what they call direct action. So you were employing the techniques of the left, in a sense, to agitate and challenge power and organize. To organize. And this, I mean, it's a way to influence elections, but more importantly, it's a way to change public opinion. Freedom Works trains Tea Party activists to recruit, to organize, to campaign, and even to write placards. But maybe not to spell. The Freedom Works strategy to reshape the Republican Party is working. Together with its Tea Party troops, they targeted moderate Republicans and replaced most of them with true believers. All summer, the Republican establishment was on the run. In Florida, it pushed Governor Christ out of the party. In Utah, it defeated Bob Bennett. It even tried to out Senator Graham as gay. He denied it. Almost no mainstream Republican has been brave enough to speak out. Bill Inglis was really need to be talking credible solutions and not about fear. We need not to be scaring people with misinformation. We need to be talking about credible ideas. That's what conservatives are supposed to be doing. People that want to lead with misinformation and scare people to do things that they would not otherwise do, to cower, that's not an American position. And so what I got in real trouble talking about Glenn Beck is I said, ma'am, if you're afraid, turn him off. Because I was trying to explain, I'm not afraid. I'm an American. Mm. If I, if I, if cowering is not a position for Americans to take. By midsummer, the Tea Party is on a roll. It has ideology and organization. What about funding? Where is that coming from? Earlier this year, an article appeared in Playboy of all places, written by a Washington lobbyist working for the Tea Party. Writing anonymously, he revealed some of the party's financial secrets. He agreed to meet me, but only if he stayed anonymous. Where's the big money coming from? For the Tea Party, you'll find generally wealthy individuals who believe it's a just cause. There are people that are spending millions. Did it start with the big money, or has the big money jumped onto a grassroots bandwagon? The, the big money followed the organization. This was an organic movement that um, attracted investors, if you want to call them that, and the investors are here to make sure that movement succeeds and they can piggyback on that movement. What does the big money 
want out of the Tea Party? They want to have a friend in Congress. They want to have a friend that, that can support um, an issue. And, and obviously, it, 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 the big money that's, that's funding the Tea Party movement typically is already aligned with those ideas, whether it's cutting spending, whether it's um, just getting government out of regulation, uh, cutting red tape. Does the big money want to change the Republican Party? The money that's flowing in to fund the Tea Party movement is in some ways going to purify the Republican Party in a way that's going to kick out folks that are not necessarily um, budget deficit friendly, um, taxpayer friendly, but um, in, in many ways this is, it's a clarifying moment for who are, who is, moment. yeah, clarifying, who is the Republican Party? And, and frankly, a, a year from now, the Republican Party will be a lot more pure than it was during the latter years of the Bush administration. The Tea Party might have started as a movement of plain folk and bare bank balances, but it hasn't taken long for big corporate donors to write the checks and push their own agenda. It's August the 28th, the day of Glenn Beck's restoring honor rally. The Kentucky Tea Party group, Justin, Mario and friends, have arrived. This is no ordinary day. It's the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech on the very same spot. The crowd assembled around the reflecting pool before the Lincoln Memorial occupies every inch on the lawns and under the trees. And there's a great swell of cheers to welcome Martin Luther King to the speaker's podium, a man who stands as a symbol of all they are fighting for. Now... He brings you an effort to restore honor in America. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Beck. Hello, America! When I knew we wanted to honor our military, I didn't want to have a military person. I didn't want to have a member of Congress or someone running for anything. I wanted to have a dad or a mom. And that's why I picked up the phone and I called a mom. And she's speaking to you today as a mother of someone in the military. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Palin. It's such a screechy honor, voice. What an honor. We stand today at the symbolic crossroads of our nation's history. And over these grounds where we are so honored to stand today, we feel the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not far away, black activists have gathered to protest at the Tea Party trying to claim Martin Luther King's heritage. Civil rights leader, the Reverend Al Sharpton, was angry. We wouldn't disgrace today by allowing you to provoke us. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, we're going to celebrate those that laid down their lives to give us a chance. This ain't about them. This is about Dr. King. You know, say what you want to say about me, but I raised a combat vet. And you can't take that away from me. Beck's symbolism is clear. Martin Luther King had fought for the civil rights of blacks when segregation and racism was rife. Now Beck wants to portray his largely white flock as today's victims of a godless America and an overbearing government. You have the same still spine and the moral courage of Washington and Lincoln and Martin Luther King. It is in you, it will sustain you as it sustained them. So let's stand together, let's stand with honor, let's restore America. God bless you and God bless America. Both Beck and Palin had insisted this was a non-political event. So no banners, no placards, just patriotic rhetoric. We are standing amongst giants. 
But the timing and the run-up to the crucial midterm elections was no coincidence. These people know what they're doing. So what did these great people give their lives for? They gave it for the American experiment. And that's what this is, an experiment. It's not just a country, it's an idea that man can rule himself. That's the American experiment. Abraham Lincoln is the centerpiece at the Beck rally, but to end slavery, Lincoln had fought a civil war to enforce the will of the federal government on the southern states. That's hardly in the Tea Party playbook. The point hadn't escaped Sharpton. But while they're down there, they ought to ask Abe Lincoln to tell them why he fought against states' rights and held the union together. They ought to read Dr. King's speech and then they need to talk to some of us who came up the rough side of the mountain. Those that made it against all odds. That's why we march. Do not walk too close to each other. I'm so proud of us for being here. Just proud of us. You look proud. I am. I am. That's the Holy Spirit going. Amen. Amen. It's not me. Yes. That's right. I guess there was just something a, a little bit disturbing about it. Um, Mr. Beck is not a man running for office. He's not asking for our votes. Yet he's up there trying to affect, mold our minds. And, you know, the, it is a kind of difficult word, but the word demagogue does kind of come into your mind when you see it in operation. I guess something even ruder would be blowhard. But let's not forget, this guy has made millions in a TV show every minute of which emphasizes what divides Americans. Indeed, part of a network which seems to go out of its way to find out what could divide Americans and then pour salt into the division to make sure that it really hurts. Do you think, the, do you think having a black president has, 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 has brought a lot of things to the top? Oh, absolutely. There are a lot of things that were there and they were nascent at the time. Right. But yeah. The fact that we elected an African-American president, Tick. all those kind of simmering right. feelings have, see, have, have come to the top, you see. See, we kind of thought in uh, Europe that electing a, bad, a black president, yeah, right. and by a decent majority yeah, by, as by well, majority, would kind yeah. of... Unite. Bring... That was the hope. That was, that was the, the hope. hope. You don't think it's happened? That's, that was the hope. What's no. happening is, it's behind the it's behind the doors, it's behind the walls. And how do you see up. it? How do, how you do see I see it? Like prime example, when he's trying to push for the economics, he, when he's trying to push for the health care. And you're not fighting against it because it's wrong. You're fighting against it because your political stand. That's wrong. The people needs the health care. The Democrats have belatedly woken up to the Tea Party threat. They see how it's re-energized the Republican base, threatening their majorities in both houses of Congress in the coming elections. Opponents are now mustering a case against the Tea Party, including its hijacking of early American history. Why is it that modern populist movements in America are overwhelmingly a right-wing phenomenon? Populists in general are backward looking. They are looking back to a golden age that was lost and we have fallen from something. And I think that for most people in the Tea Party, there is a yearning to imagine that the world is simpler than it is. I mean, I think people are very aware that the world is messy and complicated, but they want desperately to believe that there was a time when it was not so messy and complicated. When it was simpler. When there wasn't racial strife. Mm when there wasn't economic inequality, when politics was genteel, when people were good and good Christians and there, there was no messy debate, there weren't divisions, 
And for them, you can, it's actually really hard to imagine a time in American history that meets that criteria. You gotta like wipe out the 20th century, the 19th century is just dragged down by slavery, so you go to the 18th century, and if you ignore slavery, and disease and insanity and poverty and misery and women and children, the lives of anybody but these five founding fathers who were brilliant and, and whose words are quite inspiring, that you can kind of almost imagine that. And, and to, to, so to, 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 it's, a, it's a long hunt to go find this imagined place. Well, it never existed. It's, it's an America truth. that never was. As election day looms, the economic news doesn't get better for the Democrats. Homes are still being foreclosed at a record rate. And unemployment remains stubbornly high at nearly 10%. Lost jobs, lost homes. It's a toxic mix for millions of Americans, and it's fueled the Tea Party fire. In Dayton, Ohio, Jim and Randy from a local housing group took me on a tour of a once thriving middle-class neighborhood. All the houses around here look like they're unoccupied. Those uh, three definitely are. These, the, the th fourth one down is, is empty. This apartment building is empty. The one right behind it's empty. Yes. That house is empty. All three of these houses are empty. It feels like there's a kind of disease that's just spread Absolutely. around. Yep. So what would these kind of houses go for at an auction? $5,000. It's quite remarkable that in an area like this, you could buy a house for $5,000. That's a real sign. But in our county alone, there have been close to or more than 5,000 foreclosures per year for the last seven years. That's 35,000 homes. Um, sad. Yeah. Isn't it? It's a social tragedy. Well, well it's absolutely. a third of the homes that were lost in Katrina. I mean, are we right in thinking that it's what is happening, particularly to the, the white middle class, people who didn't think this would happen to them, that the Tea Party can capitalize on their anger? Sure. And the ironic thing is, is that they're capitalizing on their anger uh, when minority communities have been singing the same song for 50, 60 years. Mm. Uh, so now suddenly that it's happening to white folks, it's not okay. Well, they now see themselves as the victims. Right. So the only thing I think that might be good that comes from this is that people will finally start to recognize that, you know, it doesn't matter what color your skin, you can get screwed no matter what. The current administration didn't cause the problem. They're trying to address it, and they're blaming the current administration. That's what I think the issue is with the Tea Party. They don't understand the circle that if you can't have taxpayers living in homes, paying taxes, you can't afford basic services like fire, sure. police, schools, public transportation. Those services are going to be gone because the tax base is eroded. At a local amusement park, Dr. Joe and his family were again out campaigning against big government. Notice the repeating theme? <laughs> Even I've noticed that. Yeah. So check it out. Spendingrevolt.com. Stop spending what you don't have. Joe. Joe. No. Joe who? It could be any Joe. <laughs> Spending was Joe's biggest concern, but it's clear that for some in the Tea Party, race still plays its part. Go back to wherever you came from, Obama. I haven't seen any change. Go back to Kenya. It's a long way away, especially if you don't come from there. Of course, if you hate federal government, now that it has a black face, it means some might hate it a bit more. The accusation that the Tea Party is racist really upsets Joe. We're spun as racist. And, and what they need to realize is there's fringe people in every part. We're not going to stop racism in this country. I, I can't stop that. But again, they've turned, they've turned the Tea Party people into because they have to find... We're arguing on principles. You know, that's all we're arguing on. But instead, nobody wants to hear it. They want to spin it in the sense of we're some angry mob, but we're funded. I spent $3,000. You can ask my wife. I spent $3,000 of my own money to organize a bus to Washington. And I didn't fill the bus all the way, and I ate the cost. 
It's September the 12th and Joe's commitment to the Tea Party has taken him to Washington for a rally of activists organized by Freedom Works. The Tea Party believes it's on the cusp of a major breakthrough in the midterm elections. You can't change the culture in Washington, but what the Tea Party movement is doing today is changing the culture in America. As Leader Army said, over the past four or five months, you've seen a rehabilitation of the Republican Party. I like to call it a hostile takeover myself. But know this, we have to keep this commitment, we have to build this community, and we have to hold a new generation of political leaders accountable. The Tea Party now almost takes it for granted that it will seize control of the Republican Party. It has the momentum and the party's old establishments in retreat, being dragged right by forces it can't control. But for the Tea Party, that's only half the story. Its real target is the White House in 2012. If it can't stop the re-election of President Obama, then it will count itself a failure. This is what America's top journalists are talking about. Will historians be writing about the Tea Party in 30 years' time as a significant political force? I think that the Tea Party, if it does become more powerful, um, political power is a narcotic, and they're going to want to become more powerful. And I see them galvanizing then, and I see them electing a national leader. I really do. What role do they play in the presidential election of 2012 is going to be a big case. I mean, yes, they don't want a leader, but they do have to have a candidate. I mean, at some point, they have to figure out who they're behind. Is it going to be Sarah Palin? I, think, I doubt it. Well, I, I she's doubt. not running. Do you believe that? She's not running. Do you believe that? Yes. She's not doing any of the things people normally do if they're going to run for president. Um, uh, but I, I think that uh, she's, a, at this point, a media sensation and making a lot of money. And running for president would involve suspending that or damaging that brand. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier this year on Fox, Glenn Beck made clear what he wanted to happen. It's a bizarre bit of TV. That every time I bring up your name and somebody says... Who's out there? I answer one of two ways. I'm waiting for George Washington to appear. Hmm. And then it's usually followed by your name. Hmm. And I say, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. We need to seek in, in a candidate someone, I'll repeat this, almost reluctant to serve, someone who will not prostitute themselves and, and say what they believe a voter wants to hear at, at that time in order to get elected, but um, someone whom the people find and ask, will you sacrifice, will you do this for our country to get us back on the right track? That is why I think you're on the most admired list, because some people find you to be that. Hmm. A new battle for the future of America has begun. And the fight is over what the Constitution of the United States really means. Is America so disgusted with big government that it wants to return to a time when the federal government did so much less, as the Tea Party insists the Constitution lays down? Or is that just a pipe dream in a sophisticated, complex world? This debate over the size and scope of government isn't just happening in America. Politicians all over the democratic world are struggling with mounting debt and huge deficits. But nowhere is the debate so polarized as the United States, or the outcome potentially so revolutionary. A quarter-final place at stake next on BBC Two is Christ College Cambridge take on Edinburgh in University Challenge. And then, the first of two 90-minute specials to decide which of the professionals will be crowned Master Chef 